our keynote speaker is working to protect the, the health of our nation. And that includes confronting the health effects of climate change. We are extremely pleased, myself is honored, to welcome Admiral Rachel Levine back to Mount Sinai. She's part of the Mount Sinai family. Dr. Levine trained in pediatrics and adolescent medicine at Mount Sinai. She did her residency in pediatrics from 1983 through 1986 and was chief resident of pediatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital from 1986 to 1987. She then completed a fellowship here from 1987 to 1988. During her years at Mount Sinai, she built a reputation as talented and dedicated and a compassionate physician. She has remained affiliated with Mount Sinai uh, for many years related to her pediatric practice where she developed an, exp an expertise between the connection of mental health and physical health. In 1993, Dr. Levine joined the Penn State College of Medicine. And that's another area where Dr. Levine and myself have a connection because I graduated from the Penn State College of Medicine. At Penn State, uh, she was a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry. In 2015, Professor, the uh, governor, Tom Wolf, nominated Dr. Levine to be Pennsylvania's physician general. And in 2018, she was nominated to be Pennsylvania Secretary of Health and immediately, immediately took strong action to address Pennsylvania's opiate crisis. A year ago, President Biden nominated Dr. Levine to be his 17th assist, to be the 17th assistant Secretary of Health of the, human, the United States Department of Health and Human Services. A great honor. In March, she made history, becoming the first openly transgender person to be confirmed to a federal appointment by the United States Senate. And when she was sworn in as an admiral, Admiral Dr. Levine, she became the first openly transgender four-star officer across the eight uniformed services. She is the highest ranking officer of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps and leads a team of more than 6,000 officers who are dedicated, dedicated to protecting public health and serving the nation's most vulnerable populations. Dr. Levine, Admiral, we salute the important work that you are doing to increase COVID-19 vaccin vaccination rates and address the issues of climate change and health equity. We at Mount Sinai are very proud of your success and proud of your achievement as a trailblazer in medicine and American history. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and welcome to this conference. Well, good morning. Thank you so much, Dean Carney, for, for that really wonderful introduction. I tremendously appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you and the conference organizers for bringing us all together today to talk about mental health in the face of climate change. And special thanks to my colleagues at Mount Sinai for their tireless dedication over the years. Um, as the Dean mentioned, I performed my training in pediatrics and adolescent medicine at Mount Sinai. And then I stayed as a faculty member from 1988 to 1993. My chair and mentor was the renowned Dr. Kurt Hirshhorn. And I had the privilege of learning under him as well as many others, Dr. Angela Diaz, Dr. Scott Barnett, and many other expert and dedicated faculty. In fact, I have stated several times that the last two years of our battle against the COVID-19 pandemic has felt much like my chief resident year in 1986 and 87 in regards to the, the pressure and the medical challenges that I and we have all faced. 
In fact, I have also stated that now as the Assistant Secretary for Health, I have as much authority and responsibility that I had, or at least I felt I had, as Chief Resident of Pediatrics at Mount Sinai. Yeah. <laughs> Today, I will share some of the ways that the administration and the Department of Health and Human Services are taking action on the serious public health challenges currently facing us. In addition to the COVID-19 pandemic, these include climate change and health equity, as well as mental health and substance use, as well as the resulting overdoses. These issues are, issues are very important to the administration, the Secretary of Health, and to me as the Assistant Secretary for Health. As we continue to address the pandemic, uh, it is very important that we partner together to ensure that communities receive the mental health and substance use services that they need, and that we work to act together to mitigate further harm from climate change. The climate crisis requires not only a whole of government approach, it really requires a whole of society approach. So first, it is necessary to place the climate crisis within the context of the multiple co-occurring crises of the day that also have an impact on people's mental well-being. Of course, we remain in a pandemic and it has seriously disrupted regular care practices in medicine and in mental health, as well as resulting in significantly increased stressors for people, including anxiety and even grief. Many have been able to utilize telehealth to receive their mental health services, but not all. And this is an important health equity issue in itself. We will continue to track advancements made in telehealth and to consider the role it plays and will play in the future in providing mental health services during potential climate change events going forward. Providing care to others during COVID-19 can lead to stress, anxiety, fear, and other strong emotions among caregivers. How one copes with these emotions can impact your well-being, the care you give to others while doing your work, and the well-being of people that you care about and you care for during the pandemic. During this pandemic, it is critical that everyone recognizes what stress looks like for oneself and for one's patients. Take steps to build resilience, as the Dean mentioned, resilience in the face of these stressors and to cope with the stress. And also where to go if you might need help, if your family might need help, or if your patient needs help. The CDC has a wonderful website that can help provide the tools to recognize the symptoms of stress and help cope with them. And I encourage everyone to be familiar with these tools. Now, in addition, of course, to COVID-19, we are in the, still in the midst of a substance use and overdose crisis, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We must consider what this might mean to treat substance misuse during the time of climate change events. Climate change could also potentially increase people's substance misuse as a coping mechanism. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services recently announced a new overdose prevention strategy that fully addresses the spectrum of drug use and addiction that can result in overdose and death. This new strategy focuses on people accelerating and amplifying access to proven opioid use disorder treatments, overdose prevention interventions, and other diverse substance use treatments and supports while continuing to develop new innovative solutions. The HHS overdose prevention strategy builds on the Biden-Harris administration's year one drug policy priorities and actions taken by the administration to address addiction and the over overdose epidemic, including removing barriers to prescription medication for opioid use disorder and providing billions of dollars in new funding for prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and recovery support services. Those are the four pillars of our overdose prevention strategy, prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. Now, we cannot ignore the racially charged times that we live in. 
nor the specific and particular health inequities that people of color have experienced and continue to experience, especially in black and indigenous communities. The history of racism, systemic racism, including historical practices such as redlining, as well as the justifiable mistrust that people of color might have of the medical community have led, in addition to other issues, to the disparities that we see today. That is why health equity is central to our discussions of climate change. And climate change is not the first threat that these communities has faced. It is one of many. There are other crises that people face, including poverty, that we need to understand as clinicians to provide the best care possible to individuals. We need to explore new ways to understand and to address the social determinants of health if we are going to have meaningful progress. And we have to work closely with other partners in the administration and other stakeholders in those areas, housing areas, food access, environmental protection, environmental justice, employment and economic opportunity, transportation, and many other areas. From my perspective, as the Assistant Secretary for Health, all of those areas are health areas, even though they might be dealt with by other departments in the administration and, and, and throughout our states. Social needs and social services must also be emphasized. For example, our colleagues at the Administration for Children and Families within the Department of Health and Human Services play a critical role in providing access to air conditioning for low-income individuals through the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. That is a, a critical health equity issue as we see the impacts of climate change and, and heat emergencies that you know, we have seen for many years in the Southwest, but we saw last year in the, nor in the Northwest, heat emergencies in Seattle and Portland. I'd like to share some of the ways the United States Department of Health and Human Services is working to address health and mental health needs related to climate change. Now, in November, I had the privilege and the pleasure of joining the United States delegation to COP26, the Conference of Parties held in Glasgow, Scotland, and to announce the United States commitments to the COP26 health program. Government and community leaders from around the world with the WHO gathered together to discuss climate change. So the United States government has committed to creating a healthier, more resilient, and more sustainable future for our society, but also specifically for our healthcare systems. We have taken the first steps with a new executive order on federal sustainability that mandates that all federal facilities, including our federal health systems, achieve significant greenhouse gas reductions from energy use, vehicle fleets, and our brick and mortar, our buildings. Our department's climate action and resiliency plans will guide actions for all of the divisions of HHS to support climate change and our health equity goals. We will be looking to our practitioners and health system managers in the private sector to step up as well and partner with us to create this future together. Again, we have seen extreme weather this year in the United States impact health and mental health from the heat emergencies that we've talked about and also um, the significant wildfires that we have seen and the fires themselves and the, um, the smoke that it has produced from hurricanes that started off in, in New Orleans and Louisiana and ended up in New Jersey, uh, as well as related flooding. We have seen extreme weather shut down COVID-19 testing sites and vaccination sites. So by working together, we need to become more proactive and resilient to prevent future national disasters from adding more to the burdens of an already burdened system. An important signal of the administration on the importance of, this, of these issues is the establishment of a new office, the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, which was established in August of 2021. OT, as we fondly, fondly call it, actually reports directly to me as the Assistant Secretary for Health. And it's an office with, a, with right now a, a small footprint, but a mighty mission 
OT is leading the department's efforts to address climate change and health equity. This includes working closely with, with divisions and agencies across the department and across the administration, including CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and of course, SAMHSA, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration. We also are working with the private sector since the government alone cannot accomplish all that needs to be done. I am really proud to co-chair the National Academies of Medicine Climate Collaborative. This collaborative is identifying priorities related to the healthcare supply chain and infrastructure, health professional education, and collaborative healthcare delivery, as well as policy, financing, metrics, and many other variables and parameters. This collaborative brings together some of the finest minds in the nation to tackle the climate crisis. And so please become familiar with the work of the collaborative and you might consider wanting to join the collaborative. Our work to address climate change aligns closely with our existing disaster response work. There are lessons learned that could be applicable to the wider set of climate change events. So SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, works closely with FEMA to lead our efforts on disasters and behavioral health. Disaster behavioral health addresses the behavioral health needs, specifically the mental health needs and the substance use needs and the services that these disaster survivors need. While the majority of people experiencing a disaster do not develop a mental health disorder, most do experience distress, at least for a short period of time. After a disaster, survivors need to identify, label, and express their emotions. And they need to develop the coping strategies and resilience to deal with the aftermath of a disaster. Disaster behavioral health services support this process primarily by assisting survivors to examine and acknowledge their situation and their emotional reactions to their disaster environment. It also helps disaster survivors regain a, a sense of control and provides referrals to intensive mental health and substance abuse treatment services if required. We need to continue to explore how this disaster response work can be leveraged to address the issues of climate change. Now, while everyone will have some form of mental health response to climate change, there are populations that are uniquely vulnerable. And we've talked about this. We need to take a health equity lens to this. For some communities, climate change is not a concern of the future, but as I've been alluding to, it's a concern of today. And we will be hearing more about this from other presenters today during your conference. Geographic vulnerability is one such area. Where you live directly impacts how you will experience these effects of climate change. And we need to better understand mental health, the medical and the mental health impacts of fires, hurricanes, coastal erosion, droughts, heat, to name a few. These varied events will have nuanced effects on our mental health from the need to socially isolate due to smoke to ways that severe heat can impact the body's ability to metabolize, for example, psychotropic medications, among others. I am sure that you might have seen the recent American Psychological Association and Eco America report entitled Mental Health in Our Changing Climate. In the report, they cover many of the mental health effects of climate change, as well as some of the inequities that we should be paying attention to. So, if you haven't read it, you might want to add it to your already growing reading list. A few of the populations that we might want to consider as having unique mental health needs during the climate crisis are people with existing mental health conditions, older adults, and young people, as the Dean had talked about. For those with existing mental health conditions, we need to pay attention to how climate change events might impact their conditions and how they might possibly compound other issues that these patients have addition, and additional mental health responses they might need, such as for PTSD, trauma, and anxiety. For older adults, we might need to consider how to socially isolate during certain climate change events and how that will impact their mental well-being. We have certainly seen that during um, isolation and quarantine for seniors due to COVID-19. And we have to recognize the comorbidities of chronic disease and mental health conditions. 
Now, when it comes to young people and younger adults, you know, we will have the first generation that is actually growing up with a pretty in-depth understanding of the climate crisis. <clears throat> we have to hear more from young people about what, what they feel about our future. And what I heard at COP26, actually, from several groups about their sense of dread about the future. If you think of the stresses of COVID-19 and the current and future stresses of climate change, they are experiencing a sense of dread about the future. Yet, as we know, young people and young adults are also some of the strongest voices calling for action and for change. And we need to make space to hear about their concerns and their ideas for the, for, for the future. We have to listen to them. And I took the opportunity to do that during COP26, and we need to do that again. Now, I work very closely with Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy, our outstanding Surgeon General, and he's part of our office at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. And we you know, want to work together to address these mental health needs in children. He recently put out a fantastic Surgeon General Advisory on protecting youth and mental health. It offers great resources for kids, parents, and physicians on how to address youth, youth mental health. I encourage you to read through this document for the latest ideas. And one thing I'd like to highlight from the advisory is the reports of increased anxiety and mental health issues in young people due to climate change. This is echoed in other areas of research as well. A new preprint in The Lancet of a study called Young People's Voices on Climate Anxiety, Government Betrayal and Moral Injury, a Global Phenomenon, looks at the first large-scale investigation of climate anxiety in children and young people globally in its relationship to government response. They surveyed 10,000 youth in 10 different countries and found almost 60, almost 60%, 59% 60 were very or extremely worried and 84% at least moderately worried about climate change. It also found that climate change has significant implications for the health and future of children and young people, yet they feel that they have little power to limit its harm, making them vulnerable to increased climate anxiety. And you can look up the reprint for that. We must become more proactive in the face of these mental health stresses and work on enhancing the mental health resilience, the resilience of children and youth. Now, I believe other speakers today will be covering some of the promising practices that have been developed related to climate change and mental health. So I want to end my remarks by adding some considerations for the impact on providers. Clinicians are also personally impacted by climate change. We also can feel anxious about the future, feel, feel anger, frustration, about the world and what future generations are inheriting from us. We must develop our own resiliency, our own practices to notice how climate change impacts our own mental well being and seek assistance as needed. Clinician burnout now due to COVID 19 and other stresses, and in the future due to other health emergencies, such as those due to climate change, are essential concern. I think we need to consider the pressures that climate change can also put on our provider community. This is of concern of myself and the Surgeon General. And we need to think of the supports that clinicians need to continue to provide care during the climate crisis. We also have to examine more closely, for example, what the training needs might be of future mental health providers throughout the mental health community. There are emerging conditions such as quote unquote eco anxiety that many practicing clinicians have not yet been trained on, but we may need to learn more about this condition of quote unquote eco anxiety and related conditions, and then work to train our new upcoming providers on this issue. We need to identify ways to include how to, to, to work to include climate change into our training programs through graduate education, as well as through continuing education programs. We have had the first reported case of someone being diagnosed, quote unquote, with climate change. I heard about this at COP26. Doctors in Canada specifically linked this first world case to deadly heat waves and wildfires. And that's something else that we have to investigate and add to our list of training. So 
there's much work to be done. And it is convening like today's conference that brings me hope. Together, we can work to identify challenges and gaps and we can work to create solutions. You know, I'm a positive and optimistic person. And I feel that working together, we can work to increase our resilience and address these issues and develop solutions. So thank you for taking the time today to, to, to come to this conference on climate change and mental health and to discuss these important issues. And don't forget your colleagues who might not be here, those who are not necessarily attuned to these issues, and maybe you know they can, they can watch this uh, as it's being taped. We need to continue to bring this to everyone's attention. And I look forward to our further discussions and answering your questions. Thank you.